so much for being here, and I want to thank um, Elizabeth for mounting the show, and all of you for being here and taking an interest in what is really a, a remarkable and inspiring and surprising and, my theme for the night, an unfinished story. I got involved in this, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, when um, my wife and I hosted Ethiopian students from Israel, <clears throat> and we heard about their harrowing journey to Israel and the difficult time they had in adjustment, and I began reading a lot about the history of Ethiopia and Ethiopian Jews, and I realized that really there was no book that tried to capture what it was like for them to be part of a new and very different culture, and really quite suddenly. So that's how this book began, and I was very, um, I think, the word blessed is not an overstatement, to have a photographer like Elon, who not only takes wonderful and dramatic photos, but is a great person to travel with for months. And that's a rare combination, because we spent a lot of time um, finding things we were looking for, getting lost, and sometimes through getting lost, finding more things than we expected. So I, I really urge you to see the exhibit in the next room if you haven't done that. Uh, <coughs> Elizabeth uh, mentioned uh, the fact that Passover has just ended, and it's true that the Ethiopians see their, in many cases, escape from Ethiopia, um, and in any case, a departure from Ethiopia as an exodus, much like the Israelites' departure from Egypt. But there is another word that applies. It's not just an exodus, but an aliyah, which is a Hebrew word for an intentional going up or ascent to the Holy Land. Because it wasn't just the attempt to leave an inhospitable environment in Ethiopia. It was also had a purpose to it, to be present in the land that they saw as their spiritual homeland. And uh, therefore, the word Exodus is only half the story. The word Aliyah is the second half. And it had been long a part of the Ethiopian Jewish tradition to want to, as they put it, return to Jerusalem as their spiritual homeland. What happened when they actually did is one of the things that gave rise to this book and this talk, because they were not at home in their homeland. And that's very difficult when you don't feel at home and feel disoriented in a place where you feel you ultimately belong and have risked a great deal and lost a great deal to get there. So that is the part of the unfinished uh, nature of this exodus. I think it was best expressed by an Ethiopian who was um, asked uh, by a reporter when he arrived in Israel. This happened in 2000 something. And he said, well, I got here in 1991, but I'm still arriving. And that's the sense in which it's unfinished. And it is also the reason that I title the talk and the book, The Ethiopian Jews of Israel, rather than Ethiopian Israelis. Because this is the whole point. This community is trying to be the Ethiopian Jewish and Israeli. And because of reasons that I want to explain, the Israeli part has been difficult to achieve. And I think many of you, if you have an interest in this, will already know part of the story, but I think I'm going to be able to tell you some, uh, give you a perspective which I think is not often articulated, but I think is important. Um, so, I just want to explain the title a little more uh, completely. I've given, I've told you the sense in which the, the, this Aliyah exodus is unfinished. There's another sense too, not all of the Ethiopian Jews have been brought yet. There are still a thousand remaining um, in Ethiopia, and gradually they are being brought. That's a whole other story. 
and I will, um, won't really be able to talk about that as much at this time. But in terms of what's remarkable about this, well, you know, if you think back 63 years ago in May of 1948 um, to the founding of the state, uh, David Ben-Gurion read the Declaration of Independence of Israel for the first time in a secret location. It was the Tel Aviv uh, Museum. Not secret anymore, obviously, but at the time it was. And one of the things that uh, he said after reading the Declaration of Independence is that the state of Israel is now open for Jewish immigration and the ingathering of the exiles. So there were a lot of smart people in that room. There were 250 invited guests. A lot of them had planned the state. But I have to say, I doubt that any of them had any idea that in 63 years there'd be 130,000 Ethiopian Jews living in Israel. That was a totally remarkable um, thing to happen. In fact, they didn't really start coming until the mid-1970s. And um, I have a, uh, a way, if I'm using my remote correctly, to express this surprise in, in pictures, how surprising this story is. This is um, a Kess, an Ethiopian priest, uh, reading the Orit, the um, Ge'ez version of the Hebrew Scriptures under guard in Ethiopia in the 80s. So just to underscore the idea of surprise, I wonder how many of you will recognize this picture taken 30 years later. So that's our president with the new Miss Israel, uh, Yitaish uh, Aino is her name. And um, I just thought, and Perez is looking on, and uh, I just thought it was an interesting uh, way to show how much has happened in a mere 30 years. But let's get to the serious stuff. So I, probably everybody's geography is, is uh, good enough, but I just wanted to um, point out that in conjunction with this slide, that the connection between Judaism and Africa is fairly explicit in the Bible. There's a, a professor uh, named Ephraim Isaac, who is part Ethiopian, part Yemenite Jew. He's a Jew of color. And when he speaks, he often um, tries to explain why it's not shouldn't be surprising that there are black Jews and not just the white Ashkenazi or European Jews and Sephardic Jews. And so he comments that Ethiopia is mentioned in the Bible 50 times, but Poland not once. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think that is, that's worth quoting. Um, in fact, uh, Ethiopia uh, has, there are some well-known references um, related to the ingathering of the exiles in which um, I think the quote is something like, uh, uh, the Lord shall recover the remnant of his people from Egypt, from um, uh, Patros, from Ethiopia. And uh, in the Psalms it says, Ethiopia will uh, stretch out its hand to God. And of course, um, Moses um, of the Exodus uh, story married a what is called a Cushite woman. And Ethiopia was the translation, the Greek translation for the word Cush. So when Ephraim Isaac says Ethiopia was mentioned 50 times, in terms of the Hebrew scriptures, he means that Cush is mentioned 50 times, and that has been taken to be Ethiopia through the Greek translation of the Bible. In any case, um, there are many um, references to African, sub-Saharan Africans in the Hebrew Bible. So it is not um, a um, unheard of or um, a phenomenon without uh, references uh, deep in antiquity. So who are, the, who are the Ethiopian Jews? How did they um, come to be? Well, one of the great answers I heard to this question um, was given uh, in the 1970s by Menachem Begin, who was the first 
uh, Prime Minister of Israel to officially, as a government program, bring the Ethiopians to Israel. At the time, the world was much simpler. There was Ashkenazi Jews from Germany, from Eastern Europe. There were Sephardi Jews from um, regions that had been controlled by Spain and the Ottoman Empire and North Africa, and that was it. And as an Ashkenazi Jew, so he was asked um, when he announced that the Ethiopians would be coming, that this was not as well known then. There were only maybe a hundred in the country. And people asked him, well, who are they? Who are these Ethiopians that are Jews? And he said, I honestly, I don't know, but I know they're not Ashkenazi. <laughs> and so, in fact, if we are, want to be um, historically accurate, working from documented evidence, it really is unknown. Um, there are two types of approaches to understanding who the Ethiopians are. One I would call legendary and one I would call historical. So the legendary belief is that the um, Ethiopian nation as a whole is descended from King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, who in the Hebrew scriptures um, were documented to have met at least in a couple of times in the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles. The story is kind of left there. They met because she had come to find out how he runs um, how he ran his kingdom, basically. It was uh, management consulting, you yeah. might say. <laughs> but in terms of the Ethiopian lore in the Kebra Nagas, it was elaborated on to the extent that they had a child named Menelik I, who returned home, brought the ark to, um, to Ethiopia, and was, became the first emperor, a descendant of King Solomon. Um, there are also um, rabbinic beliefs that they are descended from the tribe of Don, and I'll explain how that occurred. Um, however, as you might expect, we're talking about events that occurred 3,000 years ago. So if anybody says, I know this to be a fact, then you need to um, have a bit of skepticism about that, because there really isn't a, a way to know that. But what there is a way to know is that the religious tradition in Ethiopia is very syncretistic. It is a combination of elements. And if you look at the traditional Ethiopian flag, you will see the cross on the left, and you will see the lion of the image of the Lion of Judah. And you may know that Haile Selassie, the last emperor of Ethiopia, who was an Orthodox Christian, referred to himself officially as the Lion of Judah. And on the right, you see a Polish Mura man from Gondar. This is actually one of Elon's pictures. It doesn't quite show up as well on the screen because of the lighting, but on the forehead of the man is a cross. I mean, perhaps you can see that where you are. He's also wearing the tefillin, the phylacteries that are used for prayer, and the tallest. So this may seem like a contradiction, but in Ethiopia, it was not. And I will um, try to give you some sense of why uh, this is true. So uh, now I want to talk about the historical view. How, um, how is it, according to historians, that this, um, these, this subset of the Ethiopian people became um, identified with Jewish practice? Well, according to some theories, if you see the white dot in Egypt, this is where the um, Israelites resided for hundreds of years, according to the Bible. So, could they have walked down to Ethiopia? Is there evidence of this? And it, there isn't much. There is a Jewish community that was found off the coast there um, called Elephantine, but there are rituals that were different from what the Ethiopians practiced, so it's suspected that may not be it. There are many other theories. I'm not going to go into them all because uh, uh, there's a very good book on it. And while I think of it, there's a reader's guide that I left as a handout in the next room. And you're welcome to take that and you'll find some historical books. So if you watch your screen in the area of Yemen or South Arabia, there were documented Jewish communities there. That's known. And it's a very short distance across the Red Sea. And there was trading going on between Aksum, which was then the capital of ancient Ethiopia, known as the Aksumite Empire, 
and these Jewish communities traded with these um, uh, with the natives to Ethiopia. So the influence of the Torah was brought. And as some historians say, Ethiopia, which later became officially an Orthodox Christian country, um, was Jewish before it was Christian. So why do they say that? Well, there were practices that came from the Torah that were part of early Christianity in, in Ethiopia. So in the fourth century, when the Ethiopians adopted Christianity, they practiced circumcision on the eighth day. Um, they observed the Sabbath on Saturday, not on Sunday. They kept similar dietary laws to, um, to the Hebrews, to the Israelites. And in fact, to this day, and I, so I'm at a little bit of a risk, there are Ethiopians here, but it's my belief that Ethiopian Orthodox Christians still do not eat pork or shellfish in keeping with the, uh, what was an Israelite tradition. So even before there was Christianity in, in um, Ethiopia, there was Jewish practice, or then you might call it Israelite practice, um, because the Christians observed as the Jews did. So why else would they do this? Where would they get this from? So a very important thing uh, to add to this slide is that Ethiopia was quite isolated. I think um, Edward Gibbon in the history of the Roman Empire had this great sentence that Ethiopia slept for a thousand years, forgotten by the world, um, we, forgetting the world by which it had been forgotten. It was a very beautiful sentence. Anyway, what, among the consequences of this isolation is that they never had access to the Talmud. And the Talmud is the basis for Jewish practice today. So when the Ethiopians came to Israel, they practiced a different kind of Judaism that it was not part of the same as was practiced by the um, Israelis. Uh, so this is somewhat of the idea that Christianity and, and the Judaism were very uh, closely allied. So just, I want to briefly take you through, um, let's see, 11 centuries, uh, <laughs> to um, explain um, how it came that Officially, the Ethiopian community, known as the Beta Israel, um, they were pejoratively known as Falasha, which is a word I'll explain later. Many of you may know what its origins were. But the Beta Israel community was had to be officially, according to the rabbinate, judged as Jewish in order to immigrate to the state of Israel. So, working backwards, in 1973, the Sephardic chief rabbi, Avadji Yosef, declared that the Ethiopian Jews, that the Ethiopian Beit to Israel were indeed Jews and should be brought to Israel. And later, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi agreed with that. So, how did he get to that decision? Why did he make that decision? Well, if we look back, he referenced the Radbaz, who was a famous rabbi in Egypt at that time, who had come to the conclusion that the child of a Falasha or Beta Israel slave was a Jew. He was asked this question by the community. An Ethiopian woman had been taken as a slave. She was judged to be Beta Israel, Falasha. That is the group that remained um, Israelite and Jewish as opposed to converting to Orthodox Christianity. She had a child. Was this child a Jew? And the Radbaz said in his official response, yes, she is a Jew because she is from the tribe of Don, the lost tribe of Don. Now, where did he get this idea? This idea actually came from the 9th century, where a travel writer, Eldad Hadani, said that he had discovered black Jews on the other side of the river Kush. So he's speaking biblically here, he's saying, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, there are black Jews. Whether this was verified or not, whether it's historical or not, nobody can tell. Um, but he was a well-known writer and adventurer 
and the Jewish world at that time, and the rabbis evidently took his word for it. Um, so, going forward, uh, in the 18th century, a Scottish explorer, James Bruce, was looking for the source of the Nile. One of the sources of the Blue Nile happens to be Lake Tana, which is in Ethiopia, and where the, the Jewish population lived, where the Beit Israel lived. And so he went there in the 1790s and he said, wow, there are actually um, people here who are practicing Judaism who deny Christianity and, and have adopted the Israelite faith. He published in 1790 his book of travels. And among the people who read that were uh, French Jews. And at first they took no interest in finding out who they were. Many years transpired between that book and what followed. And it wasn't until groups in London began sending missionaries to convert the Ethiopian Jews to Christianity that, that the Jewish groups took an interest. It took, I guess, some competition before they decided, well, if the Christians are trying to convert them, they may really be Jews and we better go out there and see. So they sent Yosef Halevi, and um, as Shari mentioned, uh, because he was white, he felt that they were Jews, but they weren't convinced that he was Jewish. Mm -hmm. So, because they had never seen um, any white travelers before. We're talking about the 1860s now. Um, in any case, he did ultimately convince them by his knowledge of Jewish tradition. And his student, Jacques Faitlovich, in 1904 went to Ethiopia and devoted the rest of his life to, um, uh, to putting the Ethiopian Jews in touch with the rest of the world. Of course, bringing them to Israel was not a consideration. There was no Israel. But even after there was a state declared in 1948, his, uh, his uh, attitude was still to educate them in modern Jewish practice where they were and not to bring them to Israel. And he died in 1955, um, having seen some of them begin to come to study there. One other thing to mention, which is going to be a theme um, throughout, is there was a great deal of American involvement in the Ethiopian Aliyah or Exodus. From the 1970s, organizations like the American Association of Ethiopian Jews Ethiopian Jews, later in the 1980s, the North American Conference of Ethiopian Jews, the Jewish Agency for Israel, the JDC, and American Federations, all participated in an attempt to set the stage and to make possible, in various ways, the immigration of the Ethiopians to Israel. Many people say, without the American Jewish community's involvement, it wouldn't even have happened. Now, we don't know. It was not to say that Israel wasn't putting out the effort, but it took more because Israel was dealing with many other issues at the time and the Americans were very committed to this idea. So the American Jewish community still plays a role um, in helping the Ethiopians. So this is a very important section of slides. The Ethiopians were let's see how to put this, they were engaged in an exodus through time, not just geography. They weren't just going from one place to another, they were going from one time period to another. And as you'll see in these pictures, which were taken in the 1980s, this is an Ethiopian uh, farming village. Most Ethiopians were either farmers or uh, masons. Um, they had a great deal to adjust to. And in these slides, I want to try to show you what this, I mean, culture shock is just a label. It's a word. But what does it translate into in terms of people's experiences? That's what I'd like to try to uh, bring out here. So these are farms in a Jewish village. In a village. Children rarely went to school. Um, uh, the literacy rate of Ethiopians coming into Israel was about 75%. That is, even in their own language, Amharic or Tigrinya, they were not literate. So it made it very hard to learn Hebrew. They, the living conditions were pretty much like this. 
And in uh, 2011, when Ilan and I went to Ethiopia to do an article for the um, uh, Jewish Daily Forward, um, and some of the photographs from that are in the next room, uh, this uh, is very much like what we saw um, uh, when we were there in 2011. So what happens is, in Israel, and this is in the town, the city of Lod, okay, in the city of Lod, the Ethiopians are moved to these big apartment buildings. Well, you saw in the earlier pictures, there was a lot of space. The villages were, had a lot of communal opportunity to observe together, to be together. They knew everyone in their villages. Here, they are put next to people from other countries. Um, they're put next to people who were maybe not from their villages, who they have not met before. Rather than have lots of outdoor space, they had very small apartments with two or three bedrooms. And so the transition in simply living accommodation is difficult. So this has a ripple effect. When you have six or seven children, which was a typical Ethiopian-sized family at that time, and you have three rooms, how do the teenagers who are supposed to go to school get to study? Many of them, therefore, were sent to boarding schools. This created a gap between parents and children. So um, the, the housing situation had ramifications. This is an interesting photograph. Um, it's an archival photograph from, that was loaned to me by Nakhoj, and it's women baking matzah uh, for Passover. And here in, in Lod, in one of the apartment buildings, is a contemporary kitchen. So diets change, and therefore people's health change. In Israel, the Ethiopian community has a great deal of hypertension, diabetes, other problems that come from a very extreme change in diet when they ate in Ethiopia only whole foods. Now, I don't mean the whole foods like the market. I don't know if you have whole foods here. Yes. <laughs> you do, okay. So they ate whole grains. They may not have had a lot of food, but the food was not processed. In Israel, it's much easier if you live in a small apartment and you have a lot of people to buy packaged food. As a result, a lot of health problems have occurred uh, due to uh, diet. In um, Ethiopia, it was illegal for non-Christians to own land from the 1400s to 1974. And the word falasha actually comes out of this. There was a large Beta Israel population in, in Ethiopia for centuries, enough to create wars between the Beta Israel and the Christians. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands of Beta Israel. And in 1415, the Beta Israel were defeated by a Christian king who declared that only Christians could inherit land, and everyone else was what was called in Ge'ez, Falasi. And Falasi became the word Falasha, which took on the connotation of a stranger, a foreigner, someone who doesn't belong. Originally, it meant someone who couldn't own land. So the Ethiopians were restricted to being tenant farmers or being um, working with uh, fire, which was considered um, a very lowly um, and even an evil um, uh, craft at the time in, in Ethiopia. So they were um, in, like a caste system, in, in a sense. And so there was very little opportunity to work. And when they came to Israel, what happened is some people, like this fellow on the uh, upper left, Destau Danto, um, someone we interviewed for the book, had the talent, opportunity, and industriousness to teach himself uh, film editing on computers. And he was employable. But for most people, um, there's a lot of unemployment in the Ethiopian community because they had transferred from a culture that was so different from the one that they uh, began in. Uh, so this does not even touch all the family issues. Um, there is, and you may have heard about this, um, 
a disproportionate amount of domestic violence and abuse among the Ethiopian community in Israel. You have to realize that in Ethiopia, the, the father was, was like the king of the family. In fact, the whole family system was upside down. Israel's a youth-oriented, a child-oriented society. Ethiopia was an elder-oriented society. The elders would eat first, afterwards the children would. And there was a tremendous amount of respect, which is actually wonderful to see. But it didn't work in Israel because the kids grew up in an Israeli environment where they learned a totally different way of behaving towards adults than their parents had raised them to uh, behave. So this creates a lot of problems. Also, lack of work creates a lot of problems. Uh, the men um, adjust less well than the women. This may not be a surprise to anybody. But in fact, I mean, there's a good reason for it. The women would take the children to school. They would take them to the doctor. They would interface with society more than the men, so they were able to get along better. And um, this creates a lot of frustration on the part of the men because they have no work, they have no money, and they don't have the respect that they are used to in Ethiopia. So, so what is happening with all this? I'm portraying this as a very negative situation. In fact, in many ways, it's very inspiring and very um, laudable. So in terms of the integration issues, Israel is, has been applauded for many um, of the really heroic um, efforts that they have made to rescue this community uh, to support them and to give them opportunity. On the other hand, there are a lot of difficulties which come from, and this is one thing that I, I said I was going to tell you some things that I don't think are articulated that often. One of them is that because there are problems does not necessarily mean there's a villain. I mean, the tendency is something's going wrong and somebody must be at fault. Now, I think that the villain in this is the difficulty of the attempt to do what Israel has been trying to do. So let me give you some, some kind of overall examples on a macro level, and then I want to introduce you to some people and how they've addressed the problems. In, I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. In 1996, there was a terrible incident um, in, that affected the Ethiopian community. Soldiers in the um, Israeli army give blood. They donate blood. And they are the main source of donated blood, which unfortunately Israel often needs. Well, the Ethiopian soldiers would go with their units and donate blood along with the others. And then in 1996, a newspaper broke the story that the blood of the Ethiopians was being thrown out. So you can imagine, I mean, this goes very deep. Um, because it is the blood <coughs> relation, one people, one blood, is the Jewish people that we're all supposed to be united. And the, the Ethiopian soldiers were losing their blood on the battlefield, but when it was donated, it was being thrown out. So this was a horrible insult. Um, and there were um, demonstrations, for the first time very angry demonstrations, outside the Prime Minister's office. So this was covered quite a bit by the New York Times. And when you go and read about it, here's what, what happened. This is why I say it's a difficult problem. It was known that because the Ethiopians had to wait so long in Addis Ababa and elsewhere, to immigrate to Israel. And because they had no money, and because there were many young men there, there were, they contracted AIDS, or the HIV virus, I should say, to be correct. And I don't know how much of it was from drug use or how much through sexual contact, but I think it was mostly the latter, because they were living in a really in an unsafe environment, and they were there for years waiting to immigrate for various other reasons. So the 
uh, director of Magen David Adam, the, the Israeli Red Cross, had a difficult problem because he knew he could be exposing people to HIV with blood from that community because it was just, it was known. And in fact, in, in my book, you'll see, I did a long interview with an epidemiologist, um, Dr. Uh, Safefe, an uh, Ethiopian, who said, this is, this is a problem. We have to do something about this. But what they did was not want to insult the soldiers by telling them, but surreptitiously they would um, get throwing out the blood. I said, this was really a terrible insult, but it was motivated by a difficult situation. It turned out, as they uh, met to try to resolve this, the two communities, that it would obviously have been better to take the community leaders, the Kassim, the religious leaders, into confidence and saying, well, what can we, how can we deal with this? We want you to help us do it. But at the time, in the heat of the moment, sometimes people don't make the best decisions. So I think this is an example of you know, a terrible thing, and yet it didn't come out of maliciousness or villainy. It came out of this is a really difficult problem. We have to do something. And in hindsight, of course, the better answers always emerge. So there were incidences, incidents like this. And I'm going to show you some slides of individuals who ran into uh, similar situations. But I want to say on the other side, look at what Israel has done for the Ethiopian community. I mean, apart from the danger of rescuing them in very dramatic operations in 1984, Operation Moses, 1991, Operation Solomon. Th these are written about quite a bit, so I'm not going to really talk about them. But this, um, once they were in Israel, the Ethiopians who were immigrated were taken into absorption centers. And the absorption centers, um, fed, clothed, housed, educated them, taught them Hebrew, taught them how to use the social services system, and they lived there for between 12 and 18 months um, to learn as much as they could. When they were ready to leave, they received from the Ministry of Housing a, um, uh, a stipend of up to 80%, sometimes 90% of the cost of their first apartment. So their housing was in large part paid for, their first house, because the government knew that they couldn't earn enough. And if any of their students were accepted at the universities, they got free tuition. So if you think about that, taking them in for 18 months, trying to educate them, giving them a housing subsidy, free university tuition for any of the Ethiopian students. Um, I mean, what, what do we do for our immigrants? <laughs> With that, or what is, I, I would challenge you to find any country that has done more for any immigrant group. Now once again, the, a very noble effort resulted in some problems. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, there, I just saw a film uh, that was sent to me on YouTube, a new film, showing how jealousy and conflict emerged between the Russian immigrants and the Ethiopian immigrants over this. And this was a film by Navit Salzberg, whose parents are here tonight. And so it's very, you know, <laughs> this is something, it's a good film to, to make. Because even in this well-intentioned environment, once again, the problem is so difficult that even trying to do good things, and these are obviously good things and very supportive, you can run into problems. So let me move on to the individual stories. Uh, I guess first I wanted to give you a sense of what the population is. Um, only 1.5% of the population of Israel is are Ethiopian. Jews, and um, that doesn't seem like much, but you know, somebody once said, um, 
A society is judged by how they treat the most vulnerable members of the society. I mean, and they are a lens through which you can look at Israeli society. I actually looked up on Google who said that, that you know, a society is judged by how it treats its most vulnerable citizens. It turns out like a dozen people have said it. <laughs> so I can't quote anybody. Um, all right, so there are some uh, headlines uh, that I collected, even in recent years, about the poverty level, about the wages of Ethiopians, and so forth. And there's no doubt that there are some injustices and that there is a problem with true integration that the uh, community feels very acutely. And in my book, I mean, this was true in 2005 and six when I was writing the book. But what I tried to do and, uh, is to find people who had positive responses, who had experienced this di uh, discrimination in some cases, or um, uh, cultural dislocation, but were responding to it in a positive way. And of course, I'm, I'm just going to show you a few um, here. Well, this is why um, I don't like to use... Um, oh, it just skipped to the end. So yeah, it's, if you press the slightly the wrong space, you can really... Um, <laughs> It has a mind of its own, but we're getting close. So you're getting a preview backwards. So if you, if you really clever, you can figure out what I'm going to say backwards. <laughs> All right, so this is the first uh, slide I was going to show you. This is Rahami uh, Malaku, and in the next room you'll see um, a picture of him with his wife and his four children. Um, so he was a, a graduated. Um, with an advanced degree in education. And he applied for jobs in Haifa, um, where he lives. And he kept hearing that there were no openings. And he got suspicious, so he used the same resume, but he changed his name to an Ashkenazi name. I don't know, Chaim uh, Oldschmidt or something. Whatever, I don't remember what name he used. But when he changed his name to um, an Ashkenazi name, some of the places that told him there were no openings invited him for an interview. So the same resume and qualifications. So he is working now. He, he just kind of ferreted out the, the clear case of discrimination. And um, then he, he worked around it and eventually got himself a job. It takes a lot of patience. Um, so Emevet um, Adgo was a student. Um, at the time I met her, she was living in Tal Piot outside Jerusalem in very <coughs> modest circumstances. I'll show you what they are. That was her trailer, which she actually shared with someone else. She was a very um, ambitious young woman. I think she was 20 or 21 at the time. She had served in the military. Um, and had been a teacher, and at the time she was working as a, like a daycare worker uh, not far from where she lived, and she was studying very hard to get into the um, University of Judaism. Well, you know, because of the cultural differences and that her family had come from Ethiopia, I think maybe 15 years before, she was at a disadvantage educationally. Not only did she have to learn Hebrew as a six or whatever year old, seven year old, um, but her family was not acquainted with formal schooling. There was no such thing. I mean, all, all of us here um, probably have had the experience of helping children in school or being helped or taking an active role in their schooling. It obviously makes a difference. Her parents were unable to do that. They couldn't speak to the teachers. They had no experience with, with uh, formal education. I'm just thinking of one um, Ethiopian man I met who was an actor. His name is Yossi Vasa. And um, he told me that he would come home from school. And one day, he remembered his father asked him to fix the television set. 
and he was like 12 years old or something. And he said, I don't know how to fix a television set. And the father said, but you go to school. You must, you must know that there's no uh, realization of what actually is taught in a school among many Ethiopian families. It's coming very slowly. And now there are uh, 2,000 university students, uh, Ethiopian university students. A lot of progress has been made. Anyway, she took the exams. And when I came back to Israel uh, about 14 months later, I checked up with on her to see if she'd gotten into Hebrew University. And ironically, she was working at Hebrew University as a security guard. She couldn't get in. And security guard is one of the jobs that many Ethiopians um, are more or less forced to take, uh, even if they're overqualified. So the, the reason that I'm telling you this is not only that she was disadvantaged just by the cultural change, but what she did about it was she took advantage of a program called Atidim, in which she could study for 1,000 hours free, and this was free to any student um, who has either geographical or um, economic disadvantages and is in an area where there aren't many schools, and they're provided um, opportunity for education. So she studied, and then she did get into the Hebrew University after that, and I just wanted I wanted to tell you about her because it illustrates something I saw again and again, which is perseverance. It, as I mentioned, all of the people I talked to <coughs> sacrificed so much, lost family members, um, four or five thousand Ethiopians died trying to get to Israel. It's hard to find a family who has not lost one family member or more in this uh, exodus and Aliyah. And they want to make good of the experience. So there's real uh, perseverance um, going on here and uh, an effort to make uh, the experience a positive one. Natan Sandaka uh, was on patrol in 2001 in Maya Sharim, a religious district, and somebody came up to him and said, I think there is a terrorist here in, in Maya Sharim in the religious district. And he asked the woman, well, how, how do you know? Why do you think that? And he said, I smell alcohol in his breath. And it was like 7 or 8 in the morning. And sometimes uh, the su suicide bombers had been known to drink beforehand. So she pointed out the person in Natan, who was a soldier at the time, went up to him and asked for some identification. And the man started running. And Natan didn't really know whether he was just uh, alcoholic or why he was running. Um, and he, he ran after him and he didn't, I asked him, did you consider shooting? And he said, no, I didn't know. First of all, there were a lot of people on the street and I didn't really know what his story was. Well, the man ran down a small street which turned out to be a, a blind alley and he was trapped at, at the back of the street and Natan ran after him and inside the alley, and the man turned to him, and Natan said, when I saw him smile, I knew he was a suicide bomber. And he tried to shoot him, uh, but the bomber set off the bomb first. And Natan um, was in a coma for two weeks at Hadassah Hospital. He had burns over much of his body which actually you can see, and I think this photograph is in the next room, and if you look closely, you can see the burn marks. And when he got better enough to be out again, what he did was to start the soccer <coughs> club to address the problem of lack of schooling and the fact that Ethiopians often drop out of school because they feel that afterwards they will not get a job anyway, so why go through the school? So he created the soccer team as a way to influence kids <coughs> to stay in school. And the reason I, I wanted to tell you that story is it underscores something that I saw time and again in the Ethiopian community, and that is the desire to bring the rest of the community along with you. There's a tremendous uh, social sense of social awareness. Um, you know, I'm used to talking 
to Americans. And it's very easy to get them to talk about what they're doing for themselves if you want to interview them. But it was the hardest thing, unexpectedly, to get to talk um, to Ethiopian Jews in Israel about themselves because they would always start off with, look, our community needs this, our community needs that. And I asked uh, someone, uh, actually, uh, someone whose sister is here, I asked Bacha Eo, is it true, my observation, that it's really, that Ethiopians are not really so ready to talk about themselves, but are much more focused on their family, on their community, and she said, well, we were raised, we're in large families, we were poor, we were taught to take care of each other, and this extended to the whole family. And I think this is a very positive, <coughs> excuse me, positive sign and reason for um, a lot of optimism because the tendency is to take care of the rest of the community. And you'll find many Ethiopians in that sort of work, whether it's legal work or teaching um, or other professions. This picture is also in the other room. There are, I, I love this picture. It's iconic in a way because these are members of one family. The man in the center is a Kes, a religious leader, a Kes Hadane, um, who was very important in Ambover and supervised many synagogues. Um, the son to his left, um, Yosef, is an Orthodox rabbi and considered the chief rabbi of the Ethiopian community. He's looked to as the liaison by the Orthodox rabbinate. And to his right is Emmanuel, uh, a not younger son who's captain. Um, in the army. And it just, to me, it represents um, the different pathways through Israeli society. Um, I was all, one of the things that I asked him about, which is in the book, is how they observe Passover. Because the Passover ritual for the Ethiopians in Ethiopia, as um, exemplified by the Kess, um, would be a completely different um, experience than the Passover Haggadah that we use. It's also a way to introduce um, Sirach Sabahat, um, who is a secular Israeli. He's an actor, and he's the star of a film that is going to be shown here in two weeks called Live and Become. If you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. It's a fantastic movie. Um, Sirach um, is a secular Israeli who brought up to me how important the Kesim, the religious leaders, are to the community, and how difficult it is to see them disempowered um, in Israel. Because as you may or may not know, um, the Orthodox uh, rabbinate in Israel uh, pretty much controls family uh, law and Jewish law. So if a couple wants to get married and have a Jewish wedding, it has to be done by an Orthodox, a member of the Orthodox um, uh, rabbinate. Uh, if they want to have a, um, a Jewish funeral, uh, um, it has to be done by uh, an Orthodox rabbi. So the leaders of the community, the Kassim, could not perform these functions. And Sirach told me that in the town where he lived, in Ramla, he, um, he saw his Kes. And the Kes, the religious leader in the town where he came from, was the one who kept the town together, the village together, and told them when it was time to leave to go to Israel. They trusted his judgment. And he was the elder with the most authority. And yet, in Ramla, where he lived, his Kes worked sweeping the floor in a grocery store. So this is the kind of thing, again, that is a result of this merger of cultures, which creates a difficult situation in which there aren't really villains. It's just that there is so much going on that where there is potential conflict, disappointment, misunderstanding, disorientation, that it's hard to solve all the problems. So it's not that Israel isn't making an effort, it's that the problem is one of those things that, uh, like many others, you have to go through, and there's not a painless way 
to do something as um, startling and unique as bringing in 130,000 people from a different culture, a different, almost a different time period, and to try to integrate them with your uh, society. So just a, a couple of quick uh, slides, and then I'll um, uh, close. There are many community activists on both the ground floor and at the higher levels. Um, this is uh, Yubi Tashomi and her mother, Aviva, Yubi was my translator for a couple of uh, several months when I was traveling in Israel. And she started a wonderful organization called Friends by Nature. And when I was driving with her, um, she was telling me about it. And it was just really a germ of an idea. But it, it also shows what the, how the Ethiopian community itself is responding positively um, to the challenges. Yuvi and her husband, who are both reasonably successful uh, at what they do, and other Ethiopian families who are successful are moving into impoverished towns where there's a lot of Ethiopians to join the community. They're not just visiting on a daily basis. They're moving there, living there, sending their kids to school, and showing the community how to empower itself to create a better life. The first town they moved into was Gadara, and they're now in eight different villages in Ethiopia where communities on this theme of bringing along their own, uh, their own group as much as they can is really evident. And this is actually putting your, your life where your principles are, not just lip service. So I think it's really an admirable organization and I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to mention organizations here that are supporting um, Friends by Nature and others. Um, so on the less ground floor level, there are members of Knesset. Um, back in the 90s, Adisu Masala was a member of Knesset from the Labor Party. Shlomo Mola was a, a member for five years until recently when he went with uh, Sipi Livni. Um, <coughs> and he uh, left the Kadima party, he um, lost his seat. But there are two more uh, Ethiopians who are now part of the Knesset in Yair Lapid's party, Yesh Latid. So the Ethiopian um, community is working not only on a kind of ground floor, grassroots level to try to improve things, but um, they are uh, getting people into seats of power, and for only one and a half percent of the population, that's really uh, admirable. Um, the last story, Ainat Astras is a, a lawyer, and she had written, or she was interviewed um, in a paper, and my wife and I were, you know, reading the paper, and she was very angry at the government for the, I guess, it, indignities and difficulties that her parents faced. Um, and she was angry about a lot of things uh, on her own. And so I thought, this is really an important person to talk to, because she's very outspoken. Um, she doesn't mince words. And so we went and we talked to her um, in her office, and she did, um, you know, she expressed all this anger. And then, uh, I'm glad I asked her this, but I wasn't going to, but I said, you know, you're a lawyer now, you are earning some money, you have a profession, you could leave. Why do you stay here if it's making you so angry and your parents? And I thought her answer was really inspiring. She said, this is my country. You know, I'm a Jew, this is my country, and I want to make it a better place. And I think she has, despite her anger, she expresses a lot of gratitude for the opportunity to work to make the country a better place. And I think along with uh, social conscience and perseverance, um, there is a great deal of um, belief in the rightness of the Ethiopian community being where it is um, and making, working to make it better. Uh, I, uh, I think, uh, I guess I've said this, but just to have a bulleted list, there are real reasons for optimism despite all the difficulties, and I think one of the best resources 
of the Ethiopian community is not necessarily the government of Israel, which I think is trying, though not always succeeding, in doing the right thing. I think they are their own best resource. Now, I was happy to see that somebody chose the proverb at the, um, at the entrance to the museum, little by little, even the egg can stand on its own legs and walk, um, which is, uh, you know, to me, expresses uh, patience, optimism in a very poetic way. I was actually going to title my book, um, Even the Egg Can Walk, because I thought, well, this is really you know, poetic and captures the whole idea. Until the publisher said to me, who's going to know what this book is about? <laughs> so it came to be the Ethiopian Jews of Israel. Which I guess is a little more obvious. So he had a point. <laughs> That's why people are publishers, I guess. Keep the business in mind. Um, I like to end with this photograph because I think it, it, we were on the streets of Beth Shemesh, um, a fairly religious town. <coughs> Uh, let's see, southeast of Jerusalem. And we were just taking pictures of people on the street. And these boys came along and we asked them, you know, you want your picture taken? And the way they were together so naturally um, and accepting just seemed like a really wonderful statement of, of hope and um, what we were all looking for. So it, it is also the last uh, page of, of my book. Um, so I just want to mention briefly, I said earlier in the talk when I was explaining how the Ethiopians came to be you know, both accepted uh, among the Jewish people and even brought into Israel, that the American Jewish community was very involved with this um, since the 1970s. And even earlier, Jacques Faitlevich came here in the 1920s and talked about what was then called the pro falasha movement, raising money for the Ethiopians. So our American involvement has been very, very strong all along. And uh, here are some websites you can jot down if you're interested. NACOJ, uh, North American Conference on Ethiopian Jewry, has um, been around since the early 80s. And they were the group that kept the, maintained the Jews together and in safety and in relatively good health, given the conditions, in Ethiopia. They were very active in Ethiopia. Now they're active in Israel with education programs. Uh, the New Israel Fund um, funds many of the, well, for example, the Friends by Nature organization is one of their grantees. But they're um, interested in um, minority rights in a civil society in which everybody has a chance. So the New Israel Fund is very supportive of the Ethiopian community as a result of that general commitment. And there are many organizations, like the Israel Association for Ethiopian Jews, that they support. So that's another one um, that has been around for a long time. Friends of Ethiopian Jews is a fairly recently formed nonprofit but they're full of experienced people who used to be part of the AAEJ, which was active in the 1970s in helping to um, stimulate and set the stage for the Ethiopian Aliyah of the 80s and 90s. So they're very knowledgeable people. And of course, as you heard from uh, Federation spokesmen, your own Federation is also working. It's possible to do more than just give money, but also in going to Israel to visit um, sites of Ethiopian um, interest, and you could check with the Israeli consulate or with some of these organizations for sites that you can visit. Many people have done that, and it's a wonderful experience of getting to know Jews from uh, a totally different environment and different culture. So I thank you for listening, um, and I... I enjoy talking about this because I feel it's a very inspiring topic and sometimes I go on too long. That's what my wife says. <laughs> but um, I, I hope you've enjoyed it. It hasn't been too long and I'd be happy to answer um, any questions or if you have comments or experiences you'd like to share, um, I'd be happy to, happy to hear them.
Did I understand you correctly <coughs> that there are only a thousand left in Hades? Last time I read it. Okay, yeah, so the question is about the, the um, Ethiopians who are still uh, waiting to come to Israel. So this has been a long and, and controversial topic. The, um, since uh, 91, uh, there were thousands in Addis Ababa, maybe 15 or 20,000. They came, um, of course, during Operation Solomon, 14,000 came at once. Then there were more. Then they moved to Gondar, Ethiopia, which is north, um, the northern province. And when we went in 2011, there were 8,000 in Gondar, which but they is were going from Gondar three, to Addis. Well, they were only going to Addis to take the plane. Yeah, they weren't living yeah. there. Yeah. So Gondar was where this new community was. It had been set up by, by NACOJ. And in 2012, the Jewish agency took it over. But NACOJ had maintained it for 10 years. But it took a long time for various political reasons um, to get the, the thousands of Jews from Gondar to Israel. Um, you'd think it could have been done in a, a few months, and in a way it could have, except there, were, there was political, um, uh, I guess, controversy about who they were, about what the budget would be, etc. Now, in 2011, there were 8,000 left. Now there are about 1,000 left. And on May 22nd, there's going to be another 150 or so brought. Um, and there soon won't be any. But the fact is, it took uh, more than 10 years to get um, 15,000 Ethiopian Jews from Gondar to Israel. It took a very long time. And that's a whole story. That's a whole other lecture, <laughs> actually. And I'll tell you briefly why. It has to do with the um, syncretistic nature of, of Orthodox Christianity and Judaism in Israel. And these particular uh, Jews were known as Falish Mora, a name that nobody really knows the exact meaning of. Um, but what it refers to are Ethiopians who had, whose families had converted to Christianity back in the 1800s sometimes. So they had returned to Judaism, claimed Jewish identity, and wanted to come to Israel. And many in Israel said, but you've been Christian for all these decades. And others, and the rabbis studied this and said, well, it's like, using the Talmudic principle, it's like a Jew who was raised in captivity and is raised as a Christian, but because he didn't have a choice. And you don't deprive him of his Jewish identity for that reason. They applied that law to these Ethiopians who had been raised as Christians by their own families and now wanted to return to Judaism. So it, it's very complex, as you can see, and that's why it took so long to bring them to Israel, probably among other reasons. Yes. I don't. I don't know if you know would know the answer to this, but um, I remember probably in the eighties and nineties, Chaim Perry, who ran a youth Aliyah center that took in a lot of the Ethiopian kids. Yep. One of his contentions was that in Israel, the great equalizer is the army, mm -hmm. and one of his um, goals was to prepare the students at that center to qualify for the army and to qualify for the more prestigious. Um, Divi um, whatever the word, yeah. divisions. Are, are you aware if if more of the Israeli uh, young men and women are, are qualifying and going into the army, and if that's still a fact that helps them then move forward yeah. in society? Yes, yeah, so the question is about Chaim Perry and the or the school that you're referring to is Yumin Or. Yeah. And they have about 600 kids, and about half of them are Ethiopian. And Chaim Perry is an absolutely amazing educator. And almost all of the uh, Ethiopian community that is, well, let's, not almost all, a very high percentage of the Ethiopians who are successful have graduated from Yumin Or, because he instills in them a pride in, in their own um, background and, and, and great self-confidence. So the army was, um, of course, every Ethiopian um, serves in the army. Everybody has to serve in the army. and. There was a time when the Ethiopian um, 
felt extremely uh, positive about this and were great uh, contributors because they saw it as a way to, to demonstrate how they were contributing to Israel. They're contributing in many other ways now, but the army was one. <coughs> and then this blood scandal occurred that I referred to. And for several years, the um, opinion of the army had soured um, for obvious reasons. But then it revived again, and by the time I was um, interviewing people um, in 2005 and six, there were about 200 officers, um, Ethiopians who had become officers in the Israeli army, which is a, no small um, accomplishment and no small advantage because an army officer is very highly respected in Israel in general. There have been, <coughs> excuse me, an increasing number, and I don't know what the number is now. So, um, I asked many Ethiopians about this, and you know, it really comes down to personal experiences. Some of them had very good experiences in the army and felt that they really were treated as equals, they became officers and so forth. Others felt that there was discrimination. And one had a slightly more sophisticated answer. His name was Johnny Barhanu. He chose the name Johnny because the, when he moved to Israel, the Israelis gave him a Hebrew name, and he said, that's not my name. But he didn't want an Amharic name because he wasn't in Ethiopia anymore, so he ch chose the name Johnny. I said, where did you come up with Johnny? He said, I don't know, I liked it. Anyway, <laughs> his, um, his experience was, he said, when I'm in the army and I'm in my uniform, and he was an officer, he says, I get plenty of respect, and I feel like I really am being treated as an equal. But if I take off the, the uniform and go to a club, um, I can tell I'm looked at differently. So that was his experience, but it very much depends on who people run into. And you could run into the kind of person who's welcoming and respects you for who you are, and the kind of person who doesn't. And uh, so there are a great variety of experiences in the army, but I think the professional soldier is, is coming back. And, and uh, you know, I mentioned the um, two new Ethiopian members of Knesset. The new uh, ambassador to Ethiopia from Israel is an Ethiopian woman. Um, Sabadja Bailanesh, I think is her name. Um, I've talked with her, but I don't remember. Is that her name? Does somebody know? Um, she, so she was just appointed um, this past year, and it's the first time uh, an Ethiopian has been in an ambassadorial position. Um, and in Ethiopia, that was much needed. I, I think it's long overdue. Evelyn? Are they allowed to vote? Why don't we just take that one more question Absolutely. and then talk informally so we have time for book signing? Yes, you Ethiopians do uh, vote. They originally voted for Likud party uh, because uh, Begin was the coup, and he was the first prime minister who brought them in. But now there are labor candidates, Kadima, um, Yeshati, they're all over the spectrum. And Ethiopians, I think their voting record is, is pretty good in terms of participation. Just one more question. Sure. Um, did anyone else? Yes. Um, are they intermarrying, or Ethiopian Jews intermarrying now with the Israelis and uh, are more women marry, are more Ethiopian women marrying Israeli guys or, is or vice versa? Or, yeah. Um, I'm in in the book. There are two uh, couples um, who are inter have a, you know, the word intermarried is quite tricky. Um, so. One of the uh, couples, um, now I think her sister is here, Tagist, yeah, is, mm -hmm. is married to uh, Golan. Uh, I'm not sure what Golan's background is, what country he's from. He's a native Israeli. And um, in, uh, else, in the book, 
uh, I did talk about another one. There's kind of an interesting story with, with Tagis, which is very tricky to tell. Tagis and, and Golan worked for Eretz magazine, very fancy uh, slick magazine, lots of photographs, and Tagis was the art director. And she was really she was a great artist. And Golan was like in marketing. And they used to ride, they used to ride from their house <coughs> into the center of Tel Aviv where, on a little motorcycle. It's a little, like a moped. <coughs> and I thought, like, this is the most dangerous thing I can think of doing if you've ever been in Tel Aviv traffic to ride on this little bike. And I was just impressed with that. And so I featured them, and they were one of the couples that I wrote about in the book. And also, I had asked them, I see, I first met Tagis before she was married. And then when I came back later, she was married, and so I met um, Golan, too. And that's when I did the piece on them. But when, um, when I was writing about them, I alluded to the fact that they were very, you know, courageous because they had told me about, you know, they get some funny looks from certain people um, being uh, Ethiopian and non-Ethiopian, and they were talking about that. So what I said in the book was, um, you, um, I said their, their courage in, in embarking on this mixed marriage is like the courage to ride through Tel Aviv on a, together on a, mo on a motor scooter. So I thought, okay, that works. And because Tagis is a good artist, I wanted to send her the layout for the book, which I worked on very hard, and I wanted it to be beautiful and have a little lot of dignity, which I think it does. I'm happy with that. But I sent her a PDF file and it included what I said about her. And she, Golan called me and said, she's very angry. And she, I said, what is she angry about? I, you know, I'm sorry to hear that, because she was very helpful to me. And she, she wrote me a letter, and, and she said, I hate that you said mixed marriage. Oh. See, because to her and to other Ethiopians, it meant that one of them might not be Jewish. See, that's what they think. That's what they thought of. And of course, I now the book had gone to press in China. So I called the book packager and I said, "What does it take to change that page?" So I was afraid it couldn't be changed, but he said, "I'll, I'll call him and get back to you. Five hundred dollars to change that." It's worth it, I said. <laughs> I don't care if it's 5,000, you know, so I didn't want, this was, you see, even when you really understand the situation, it's so easy to, to um, miss the mark because the, the sensitivities are not always where you think they are, and it's really hard. So even for me, and I was really sensitive to all these issues and even writing about them, I, what I said was offensive because I didn't understand it as they understood it. understood it from an American perspective. But for her, it was, what's important is, it's, there's, it's not, is it intermarriage? So that, that's what caught me when you said intermarriage. Well, there are two Jews, so. But I understand exactly what you mean, and it's not common, but it does happen. And actually, there's a third a couple in the book, now that I think of it, the actress, um, Meski Shivru, who's in a couple of movies, actually she's in Live and Become also, um, uh, she um, is married to a native Israeli, not from Ethiopia. So they are also in that book. So it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So I think yeah, it's, we'll 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 stay, and um, Len will yes, stay, I'll, I'll and, uh, and and you can look at the exhibit questions, and please. ask questions more informally. But thank you again, Len. That was beautiful. <laughs>